talk. Now, I'd like to talk in this uh, brief period that I have before me about the left and about Marxism in particular, and within that, about the Frankfurt School as a particular type of Marxism. We've never had a speak and we've never had a talk about the left before in these gatherings as the new right, per se. Now, from one level, if you're an extreme leftist now in the Western world, in Western Europe, maybe parts of Southern Europe, yes and no, and, the North, and North America, you look around and you'd think there was a cultural desert that you'd lost completely, that communism had collapsed, that far-left movements have no votes at all, except residually in Italy, to a much smaller extent in France, and a few places elsewhere. You'd think that the socialist dream, that life could be better and more equal and free and so on, had come crashing down completely. And yet, paradoxically, these people have lost a world and yet gained another. Because their values, in a subtle way, in a mediated way, in a transliterated way, are the values that exist largely of the society out there. And when you go down and remove Sky Sport and put something else on, and even there, residually, you will find what a Marxist would call the reification of triumphant values. In other words, a soft left viewpoint put again and again and again in every media, at every level. Now, how has this occurred? that a force which in a hard way seems to have lost everywhere, its states have gone down, its military structures have gone down, its Chinese and Asiatic version is producing a mass super capitalist version with an increasingly post-left, indeed even racial elite, that managed the society technologically and his ideology is frozen into a type of theology. Uh, many Marxists are in despair in this era. And the Frankfurt School that we're going to have a bit of a look at in this talk actually is in some ways a movement of despair both within Marxism and within Western thinking. Yet this victory and defeat and defeat in victory that we have all around us is something that I want to look at. In England in the early part of the 20th century intellectuals of left and right often used to debate with each other. This is really no longer possible now 80, 90 years on. G.K. Chesterton, Hilaire Bella, Shaw and Wells knew each other well, often had debates with each other. The irony is that if you said to them or their audiences, it may be in venues like this 80 odd years ago and more, that we would have in the early part of the new millennium a left-wing capitalist society, people would have said, you're mad! You know, the idea that the market can adopt the values of the folded out, libertarian, slightly soft, but not entirely so, left, would have, perver would have been regarded as perverse by almost any social and ideological commentator of that era. But it's what we've got, and it's all around us, and it's sort of uh, in the ether, it's all pervasive. Even to cut against it in a very minor way is to create a shock somewhere. Certainly if you're anyone of any reputation, or any foreknowledge in the culture, and you make a remark which is incorrect, and you're known, and you've ventilated it as such, there's a tremor in the web. And my interpretation of this is that hard Marxism, stroke Marxist-Leninism and various anarchistic and other variants, often to one side of it, have failed. But the trajectory of the ideology itself has succeeded, has morphed, and has transfigured itself in a new way. You've had the left has come into the centre, taken it, turned it around, and what we call liberalism now, either with a small or a large L, is not the liberalism of 50 to 60 years ago. It's not even the liberalism of 150 years ago. The truth is, the people who led Palmerston's Liberal Party have views which, in the middle, say, the middle of the 19th century, could be construed as people who are not to the right of this gathering, then wouldn't have been too far away. The Protestant ideological moralism that underpinned liberal ideas of a traditional sort has been wrecked out. So it's become a materialist and secularist ideology prone to infiltration and change by forces from its own radical left. One of the things that's most germane to the Frankfurt School is the Frankfurt School repudiates those elements of communist practice that liberals don't like. The harshness, 
the camps, the belief in struggle, the secret police, the art of the people and the crushing out of anything that people don't like. Vyshinsky screaming that ex-comrades should be killed, beheaded, and their families tortured before they die. All in the name of love, and humanity, and peace. The French Communist Party organ was l'humanité. Humanity. Torres, who was the leader in the post-war period, was personally trained by Stalin in exile during Vichy to take France, which the Eastern Bloc believed more than Italy at that time, was the first Western domino to go within Europe, get them out of NATO, align them with the Warsaw Pact, create chaos inside the Western Alliance and so on. Now, Marxism grows up, of course, from the 19th century, but before Marx gave state socialism and ideological socialism, a pseudo-scientific glass and formulation. There have been various other theories, Saint-Simon, Fourier, utopian types of socialism, some of them the secularization of Christian libertarian ideals. Marx was determined to reshape not just the nature of the left, but the nature of philosophy and the Europe of his time and the world for all time. His type of trajectory relates to a particular view of society that certain intellectuals have. Although he never specified it as such, Marx and those of his ilk who came after him, in a wide range of theorists who've almost died out today, there's not one major Marxist theoretician really who's alive today who's of any importance. You get a minor, minor figure like Alex Kalankin and Kass who was associated with the Socialist Workers' Party at one time, occasionally bobs up. But these are people of almost no importance whatsoever. Baudrillard, a major theorist like this, are cynical, materialistic liberals and libertarians who laugh and who sneer at everything, and it's all a great game to them because they're concerned with language, what it means, what it doesn't mean, how it can be repositioned and so on. They're not really Marxists at all. The last really powerful thinker in that trajectory well, there could be two of them, really. Sartre, in a way, and Adorno. <coughs> and after them, there are just minor figures who floated out. So this entire mass of theory that begins with Marx is part of the idea that intellectuals can totally dominate society. <coughs> in the Anglophone worldview, intellectuals are, on the whole, praised and privileged to a degree, but also accorded a very minor status. In France, and in Eastern Europe, which often modelled itself on French patterns of intellectual culture, intellectuals form a class within the society which is very coherent and quite hard-edged. And it's understood that you do the academic jobs, you do the higher journalistic jobs, you do the high upper tier pre-modern professional media jobs, you write the books, you run the galleries and so on. It's, almost, it's not just an interhate group of individuals, it's a tier with its own morals, its own way of behaving its own salons, which are the parties and groups where this particular subset of intelligent people meet. I went to an intellectual salon, run by a continental European, of course, when I was 18, and all the intellectuals were talking about ordinary people. Because that is the class division if you're an intellectual. There are those who live for the mind and ordinary people who don't. So they have their own mental class division within that. And Marx, in his own way, was a radical twist on some of those ideas. He believed that theory could dominate life and social process to such a degree that it could change the world and even human nature forever. One of the important things about Marxism is its total and utter break with the past. Its total and utter break with all religious ideas. <coughs> there is nothing supernatural. They're just human theories and myths within language. There is nothing prior to man. There are no eternal values whatsoever. Everything is in the now, and everything is based on materialistic precepts which we predetermine every aspect of life. This means that in the high regime and ferocity stage, communism represses religion with extreme and often irrational violence. You always know that a communist movement is falling back again into social democratic centrism and state socialism when it allows people to adopt a religious preference. After the Soviet collapse, when the Communist Party reared up again, and in one of Yeltsin's internal elections, one of the ones that his forces won, they had a bit of a chance. They said that Christianity and Orthodox Russian Christianity was now compatible with Marxist-Leninism, which is the key to a weakening of the resolve for struggle, because the desire to crush out religious belief, even to the degree of atrocity, such as those committed by Pol Pot, 
in Campuchia, for example, where there was an actual attempt to kill every self-defining Buddhist in the society is an attempt to eradicate completely that which exists before. Mao, who was even more psychologically radical than Marx himself, believed completely contrary to all biological ideas that man is a piece of paper. Man is a white sheet. You can take a man and torture him to a gibbering wreck. You can take a man and say he's a god and then shoot him afterwards. Man is changeable and plastic and can be moulded by struggle or what they call dialectic. Ideology in life and in language and in history. Give me a man for half an hour and I'll make him a communist. It's this sort of idea. And occasionally, many of their theories, when applied, such as to American prisoners of war in the <coughs> Korean War, for example, had a certain salience. Maoist behavioural theories worked on these lines. They believed that there's a 5% leadership caucus in all groups. So you take the officers away from the men when you've got them captured. Then you take away the non-commissioned officers. Then you take away the moral officers, those amongst the men who are the elite, amongst the mass of the troops, who have personalities which would be known as leadership personalities. In crisis, people would look to them. If the officer has fallen, they become the officer. You get rid of you remove them. You either shoot them or put them in a separate camp or send them back to the Americans. You want the mass that you can mould and destroy and remake. And they did it with quite a lot of them. Many of them came back to the US three or four years later, mouthing sort of Marxist platitudes, you know. We invaded the third world, man. You know, we deserve what we got. And this sort of thing. In, Amer in, the, in the Vietnam War, some of these tendencies to deterioration and degeneracy in the American army became so large that many of them would shoot their own officers rather than go out on patrol, which is one of the many reasons why they ended in a surreal mess prior to surrender. America, of course, conducted a mass bombing campaign, said they'd won, and then cleared out, which is uh, a scenario they may repeat in <laughs> Iraq and Afghanistan in the next couple of years. But to return to our theory, Mar uh, to our Marxist theory, Marx emerged really first in a group of radical German intellectuals called the Free Ones, De Freyen, who used to meet in a beer cellar in the 1840s. In the 1840s, of course, liberalism and nationalism went together as ideologies. Now, 150 years on, their daggers drawn. But in that group in the 1840s, there were gathered some of the most radical, let's change the world intellectuals, in Germany, in Central Europe. Many of them have been forgotten today. Uh, Rothbard and Otto Strauss have been forgotten. Farbach's only remembered because Marx wrote an essay about him. Max Stirner is remembered for one group, book he wrote about extreme individualism. But in the corner of the paintings of the free one, as they get free ones, as they gathered in this cellar, there's a tall Gentile, Engels, the factory owner, the financier of the theorist, and Marx, then with an enormous black beard, because he was very young then. Marx's idea is you had to smash all the theory, particularly all the progressive theory, that predated him. That's why he began with the German ideology um, he began with Groundwork, Grundrisse and the German ideology. You must clear away all these false and fake progressive ideas based on liberal thinking, bourgeois semantics and utopianism. Everything must be based upon science and upon matter and must be provable and must be empirical. He believed that intellectuals could so interpret the changes in society that they could master the consciousness of a society, change it and shift it and force it in directions that even hadn't entirely been predicated on the theory. The one thing you notice about Marxism is it's a seething vortex of ideas. It's always restless. It's always counter-propositional. Marx will make a statement, then he'll qualify it. Then he'll withdraw it. Then he'll make another statement, which is more radical. And this is part of, again, what they call dialectic. Now, the idea of dialectic is based on Hegelian theory, and it's based upon an ancient Greek thinker called Heraclitus, who believed that everything is in flux, and everything changes, and everything works on itself. The fury with which Marxists fall on each other in intellectual dispute, often about arcane matters which are of no relevance, which in a regime context is a choice between life and death. You advocate the dialecticism of a particular crop cycle, and you get it wrong, and the party sides with another, you're shot, and your family's shot, and those that are related to them are shot as well, because ideas are important. The man who thumbs through the garden on the tube and thinks ideas, he cares. To a Marxist, ideas are life. And you write them in blood because they're important. 
They suppress artistic forms because they believe they're important enough to merit that. And that's the uh, difference between why they almost conquered a world and didn't in various ways. Now, Marxists on the whole form two camps in my mind, politically and ideologically. In all Marxist groups you get rather weak, pacifistic, loving, humanistic people. The vicar's daughter who believes human nature isn't right. If only we could be nicer to each other. If only we could spread more love. You get these people always in ultra-left and communist groups. And next to them on the podium, next to them in the, on the, in the auditorium, you are utterly nihilistic, ruthless, virtually criminal types who want to use the structure of power when they get it to crush those underneath them, don't give a damn about ideology, and are actually amongst the most misanthropic people you could ever meet. And you have these extremes of the innocent lovey and the sort of sadistic amoralist in the same group. That's why when a communist regime comes in, they, pr they have enormous purges, because they have to start purging their own to get rid of all the idiots. To get rid of all of those who believed it was love, 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 and they're led off by the men in leather jackets. Because you've got to get rid of those fools early. If a right wing regime is formed and there's a purge, it's because it's people struggling for power. That's what it's about. Now, Marxism, Marx in the British Library began writing sort of pure theory as a critique. The interesting thing about Marxism is, in a strange way, it's unoriginality. Epistemologically, it's Hegel, and that's the theory about how it thinks about its own theory, and Heraclitus. Politically, it's the ultra-left of its own time, fitted in and made to do service. All of the classical liberal thinkers, from Adam Smith onwards, who underpin capitalism as an idea, Marx doesn't think up an original theory in relation to them. He critiques them. All Marxism is a shadow. It's a critique. It's a sort of feeding on the carcass of something which exists before you. You critique it, you turn it around, you re-engineer it, and you come to our on the basis of a negation. So the negation of that which exists before is a key to the nature of this type of thinking. And then you negate the negation. And then you negate the negation of the negation, and you go on and on. The most radical version of state communism is Trotskyism. The idea that you have a regime that renews itself through endless and perpetual struggle. There is no rest. There is no motion. Trotsky wrote endless sentences like this. No, ro no love, no serenity, no stillness, no motion, only the struggle. And of course, Stalin took him at his word, which is, why, <laughs> which is why he purged them all from the party up to 1928. But until then, of course, they were giving almost as good as they got. And both sides in that dispute worshipped the parent. Lenin. Now Lenin was taught his Marxism by Plekhanov, who was a Menshevik, who didn't like um, the Bolshevik Revolution. Quite a few Marxists who were purely sort of almost gentle professors of cultural destruction. They didn't actually like the Bolshevik Revolution because in actual fact it's contrary to some Marxist theory. The idea of the Plekhanov school is that if in a totally undeveloped society you have a militarist coup by a left-wing armed group, which is what the Bolshevik Revolution really was, you will end up in an extremely nasty, what we would call today, third world dictatorship, which is exactly what happened. Because in their theory, you have to allow capitalism and the bourgeois class, which is loathed and yet admired, strangely, simultaneously, to reach fruition, to create the proletariat industrially, that then the split, uh, leaders from the bourgeoisie split off, form the communist vanguard, link with the proletariat, revolutionise the world and create defective communism, create socialism, the first step. <coughs> so it's a progressive cycle. Um, the Leninist way of dealing with dissidents is to just shoot them. That was, uh, Lenin at the end, half his brain was virtually liquid towards the end. Massacres on every front. The civil war was going badly, they won that civil war because every man on their own side who retreated more than eight paces, the secret police stood behind them and shot them. And Trotsky introduced that and advocated it in a booklet called The Necessity of Red Terror. The Necessity of Red Terror. I met Corin Redgrave once, who was one of the leaders of the Workers' Revolutionary Party. And Redgrave, who's this sort of rather depressive sort of actor basically, 
uh, piped up in the middle of this party as he was chain smoking. He said, when we're in power, he said, we're going to have iron hard, iron hard destruction of the bourgeois class. Like this. And I said, but Corrin, you could be regarded as one of the most bourgeois men in Britain. And he said, no, no. He said, it's all in the mind. <coughs> and of course, it is all in the mind. He said something very interesting to me about the extraordinary mental arabesque that this theory can cast. Somebody said, well, what about Stalin then, Corin? And he said, Stalin is the recrudescence of the theory of the class enemy, which occurs mentally as a hypostatization within the class that falsifies his ideology and history and is the class enemy at a particular moment of struggle. If you refer to Trotsky's The History of the Revolution, chapter 8, paragraph 92, he tells you everything that you need to know about him. So it is almost an urge Now, many people, uh, I've known a few Polish people in my life, and Poles learned Marxism-Leninism at school after the creation of the Gomorrah's regime after 48. I went to a Catholic school, although I'm not a Catholic, not even a Christian. And he had four periods a week of religious knowledge. And they ripped that out and replaced it with Marxism-Leninism. The same four periods. You learnt the Paris manuscripts, the early idealistic stuff in 1844, which he then reverses. You then go on to the scientific socialism, <coughs> so-called, of the German ideology and the groundwork, which wasn't published in East Germany, um, probably under Ulbricht, really, in 67. Then you go on to Capital Volume 1 and Capital Volumes 2 and 3, which Engels writes later. Then you go on to Engels' parallel material, which is slightly different to Marx. Then you look at people like Plekhanov. The irony about this pure theory is that without the mountebanks, without the political criminals, without the guerrilla terrorist figures like Stalin, they would have never got anywhere. Because they married this theory to sectarian propaganda and conspiratorialism by small, violent and often criminal groups. And this is a rival tradition that goes back to the French Revolution, if you look at people like Babeuf in the 1790s, but in particular is Blanqui's tradition in the 19th century. Small, close-knit revolutionary bands that almost no one's heard of, who swim around these theoretical groups, wait for a crisis in society to use armed force at a crucial and strategic moment, and then build a structure on the basis of the theory, which often hardens just into a secular theology, whilst they're really concerned with the exorcism of pure power. I saw a thing that's interested me recently in Forbes magazine in the United States, which has a rich list. <coughs> and it said that Castro's personal fortune was 70 million US dollars. 70 million US dollars. And they described him as a communist prince. And there is an interesting side to these types, but often because they take illicit and semi-secret shares in state-owned industries, the families that own the original sugar and tobacco industries in old Cuba would be shot or heaved out to the states. They would reappropriate in the, na in the name of the masses, which means a slice for the Castro family. And of course it might be quite small in terms of equity when it's taken, but over 50 odd years builds up to an enormous fund. And yet many communists that are, or Marxists that I've known are in some ways not particularly materialistic people. The whole point in the communist movement is that you often owned nothing, often you left very little except for these monarch types that I've just mentioned, because they lived for the recreation of man. They believed in the total change in almost all areas of society. Probably the most extreme communist experiment of all was Pol Pot's in Campuchia. Now, Pol Pot, of course, wasn't his real name. It, in some ways, means political potential, which is what Maoist instructors in China called him. Political potential, Pol Pot. He has political potential. Pot himself was a nerdy little man with a lopsided smile and a sadistic desire to impose a type of peasant-based, anarchistic Marxist theory. One of the interesting things is when he was a student, and Indochina strongly influenced by French imperialism, of course, when he was a student in Paris, he sat in on lectures by such... I did both one, by a feminist theorist called Kristeva, who was also a Maoist at the time, and he sort of wrote down things that they said, but in a sort of cretinous, future sadistic way, like, the family is a gun in the hands of the bourgeois class. Destroy the family. Yes, destroy the family. Make everyone live in communes. Destroy the bond between mother and child. 
and husband and wife. Everyone is therefore part of the masses. And Norman Hippel is wonderful. And when he got the chance to do it in a society with gangs of terroristic teenagers, many of them out of their minds on drugs and so on, he did it. He put people in large barns. And if you said you wanted to see your uncle, he said, I'm your uncle. <laughs> and he was, the person was dragged out and their head beaten in with the butt of a machine gun because you weren't worthy a bullet. So um, that is the sort of, sort of high theory these French Parisian literati types have hardly ever had a problem in their lives at all who are rebelling against the norms of their own culture almost as play but they give the language and the sort of action theatre to these types who internalise it all and although most of them just remain Gerard Healy like idle dreamers on the margins of western society if they ever really got the chance to do it they would impose it because they believe it's morally right to make that imposition. And the idea that these theories are morally right is important in relation to their reception at a later time. Because I believe that contemporary liberalism has recycled a large number of these theories and treated them purged of nasty Soviet, Maoist and other accretions as something normative, as something given. 70 years ago, many of the values that face us in the media and elsewhere would have, amongst normal and apolitical people, been regarded as abhorrent. Now they are normative, and even to speak out against them is to essentially embrace thought criminality. But there's a degree to which the reason this has occurred is because a hybrid is developed between post-war secular liberalism and the Marxism of the past. And this is what I'd like to discuss. The Frankfurt School grew up in Germany as a particular response to modern life. Marxism believes in crisis. Everything is in crisis. The family is in class, in crisis. Class relations are in crisis. Race, which they don't accept as a social concept because it's an anthropological concept and isn't reducible to economic materialism, but it does exist because it exists in the minds of reactionaries and so on. They think that the endless critique of what has gone before prepares new grounds and vistas of struggle. So the purpose of the Frankfurt School was to critique all Marxism. To bring back a more purified and critically intelligent form of the dialectic which could be used in modernity. The Frankfurt School is quite complicated because there's a strong streak of pessimism and despair in it which is very unusual in Marxism. Another really unusual thing is that very Germanic forms of Marxism, such as those proffered by Lowenthal, by Horkheimer, by Adorno, by Naumann and others, who were prominent in the school, linked to forms of Anglo-Saxon, American and imperial thought. Why is this? Because of the existence of fascist governments in Central Europe in a certain time, all of these sort types sought refuge in the United States. When Adorno was at the University of California and the Frankfurt School had been closed down by a certain notorious government in Germany at that time, he developed various psychological theories which are quite interesting, even in relation to this present audience. He developed what he called the F scale. F was for F for fascism. And this is a personality test which under a different name is still used quite widely. It's a test for the authoritarian personality to see how fascistic you are in relation to trigger words. Many of these ideas have fed through into the doctrine which is now called political correctness, but they've morphed and changed over time. And um, rigidity in relation to prior assumption. Ability to follow a leader without question. Undue respect for authority dialectically related to the idea that you want to exercise authority yourself. A sort of love-hate relationship to the police. And this sort of thing. Adorno ticks all of these boxes. So he's very obsessed with the micro side, which on the whole Marxist theory, which loves grand architectures of theory and great spasms of language for its own sake, usually neglects. Marxism himself, Marx himself, of course, was a combination. Capital is full of endless detail about the suffering of the poor in capitalist societies. One of the reasons many Western idealists were attracted to it in the early part of the 20th century. Because, of course, for every new development, there were many victims. Marx, if you read Capital, was endless section about crushed children and machines, people suffering in the early stages of industrialization. But the area could almost be Cobbett. 
and yet it's linked to the idea of an enormous theory that can transform the nature of reality for human good well the problem with all Marxist theory is it's counter propositional in relation to what we are what all races are, what humanity is and all mankind is as a whole we're based on nature we have our being in that substructure we are not as leftist ideas would have us one of the reasons for the extraordinary rapacity of communist terror is I think a sense of disappointment on a cosmic level when you get into power you realize that human beings are partly avaricious partly sexual partly acquisitive partly territorial partly communal partly group identifying everything that your theory said that they weren't and there's a strong element of concealed and not so concealed in the regime phase misanthropy in communism that if humanity can't be redeemed in that way we'll fall on them anyway um, it's almost a secularization of the idea of sin they've disappointed us and so they'll suffer and maybe through the infliction of various agonies like Procrustes' bed the man lies on the bed and his arms are over the side and his feet over the bottom and you think I've got to get him to fit the bed so you cut off the feet and you cut off the hands and you say Pol Pot says um, the leaders of the Derg, Mengistu in Ethiopia says look our body fits the bed but it's limbless <laughs> and that's how you've made it fit now Adorno wrote a whole series of books and the most uh, negative dialectics uh, Minima Moralia Aesthetic Theory which is an enormous book this thick 800 pages it's in Routledge and Keegan Paul um, was, uh, he was a pessimist Adorno all the photos used on the Routledge editions of his books show him with one hand over one side of his face dwelling upon the pain and misery of humanity he believed in a strange way that has echoes of cultural conservatism to it paradoxically that the masses are totally brutalised and dehumanized by capitalist ideology he believed that everything has been sucked into the spectacle of mass culture to such a degree that there's no freedom for the masses at all because he never, he never thought do they even want to be free that's a question that is off limits essentially everyone can be free everyone can be rational everyone can be equal to say otherwise is to render yourself a beast and a demon a reactionary outside of the doctrine of progress and enlightenment so remember that his first book was called The Dialectic of Enlightenment which he wrote with Horkheimer and which is an interesting thesis because like a true Marxist he goes right back to the roots and one of the paradoxes is that although liberalism's embraced a lot of soft Marxism this is an, a ferocious critique of liberalism the uh, dialectic, dialectic of Enlightenment is an attack on the Enlightenment he ferociously lambasts these liberal theorists for their reactionary nature for their desire to exploit man in the name of capitalist progress for their desire to dominate nature Adorno believed that fascism was a natural reaction against capitalistic exploitation and the desire liberals, liberals had to exploit man and nature Adorno so far to the left that liberals are the enemy never forget that for a true communist the liberals are the scum and the middling ones who will, you will give enough latitude and you will give enough rope to before you hang them I think Lenin in one step forward two steps back says all these social democrats and so on we allow them their time we allow them the time on the stage to weaken the right to weaken religious belief to open the way for us and when we're there then we hang them we hang them and we enjoy it because they're worse than the bourgeoisie because they're traitors to the class in history and we will deal with them with utter ruthlessness that we won't even treat reactionaries with that's the real Leninism talking but Adorno doesn't like that sort of talk at all um, because although he's not a humanist he does believe in the Alsatia of forgotten possibilities don't forget for a Western Marxist and this theory is called Western Marxism or Euro-Communism as it became the Soviet experience has been a disaster privately Marxist professors I once had a conversation with E.J. Hobsbawm who was the Marxist professor at Birkbeck the extramural and evening college of London University and he said in private of course well I was a member of the Communist Party of Great Britain so I would never have admitted this but the entire Soviet experiment has been deleterious 
You know, 20 million dead, 50 million dead, multiple wars, dictatorship. It's been deleterious <laughs> as he reaches for another drink. You know, he said all it achieved was the socialisation of the means of production. So it's not enough. It's not enough. You know, and yet when the coup happened against Gorbachev, he supported. Um, the coupsters, he supported the coup d'etat for reasons of what he called revolutionary conservatism. You should hold what you have, even if it's totally broken. You know. Um, but Hobsbawm's interesting because Neil Kinnock was a close personal friend of his. And there's always been an interconnection, not between communism and elements of the Labour leadership, certainly in the Cold War period, but between Marxism and the Labour leadership and other leaders who are regarded as more liberal, more <laughs> social democratic, more moderate. At the beginning of the 20th century, social democrat meant Marxist. By the end of the 20th century, there were people who were, you know, allied with George Bush one, and were Atlanticists. Je Healy begins, um, Dennis Healy, begins in the Communist Party youth wing, ends up a right-wing social democrat and an Atlanticist supporting the Vietnam War. Something Wilson slightly intelligently kept us out of, but the Australian support on our behalf. So, there's a strange element to which Marxism is all right, at least when it's considered to be a theoretical add-on to centre-left disputes. Claire Short's a descendant now in the modern Labour Party and is advocating a hung parliament, even has left that whip in the House of Commons. But when the Soviet Union went down, she was asked, is communism dead by some independent-type journalist? And she said, communism may be dead, she probably went in the West, but Marxism isn't. And this idea that the theory can be <coughs> obtained, retained, rebranded and recycled even though the hardcore vanguard politics has gone down is something that most of the left still believes. One of the reasons liberalism has triumphed in this society is the mental wetness, irresolve, ir 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 fear and funk of conservatism <laughs> morally and intellectually and ideologically. <laughs> and I mean... I don't just mean naked middle class self-interest and sort of a slightly impoverished range of politics based around that, which is the core of all centre-right parties. What I mean is conservatism philosophically and intellectually. Unlike the moderate left, that's always looked to the far left for its energy, for its theory, for its radicalism. They repudiate bits they don't like, particularly the harsher bits, but they come in, brother. Come in, comrade. They take it into themselves. Conservatives even of the Professor Roger Scruton and Morris Towling type, there is a permafrost between them and the far right and radical right ideas. This means theoretically and mentally they've cut part of their own body off. Whatever their much more moderate political views are, they will not take the energy which exists to one side of them. Always in thinking, which is one of the reasons intellectuals often make bad politicians, thinking goes to the margin of the prospect of a thought. Politics often has to deal with great masses of people, with what they can understand and appreciate, with short attention spans, with people who've got a hundred other things to do. Politics is even in a society, a minority sport amongst a minority sport. People who hate each other, but are political, often have more in common psychologically than the anonymous mass of people who don't give a damn how they're governed as long as there's bread on the plate the day after next. And because conservatism has cut itself off, from racial biological, from elitist, from Nietzschean, from radical views, because they regard them almost in a satanic light. They couldn't fight back against liberalism because they had no mental ammunition. And because conservatism <coughs> is an anti-intellectual attitude anyway, often philistine, often atheoretical, when a Marxist version of centre-leftism comes along, they increasingly laughed at it, scorned it, accepted it a bit, accepted it a bit, moved to the side, said they were against it, pushed away and agreed just a bit, accepted a bit, then another generation would accept a bit more. Then another generation would accept a bit more. The average Tory in 1960s would have regarded race as a fact of social existence. Now you'll be expelled from the modern Tory party for saying that. That's 50 years, 40 years. It's nothing. Half an adult lifetime. And that's because of what's up here particularly amongst relatively sort of unintelligent people up to a point, although there are many intelligent people in the Tory party. But it is because of the Second World War and its aftermath and the fear, the self-loathing and self-hatred in many relatively normal, 
quote-unquote conservative people who are the mainstream in any society. In any society, you have to have a mass of people who are a bit stuck, a bit boring, a bit uncreative, because they are the bedrock. They're not going to be exceptional, but you can't have that in any social order. One of the delusions of Marxism is that everything could be different. Trotsky wrote an extraordinary essay in the early 1920s when the Soviet regime had just been created and was caked in blood. He wrote this essay saying, when we've achieved pure socialism, there'll be a Wagner, yes, a Wagner. There'll be a Shakespeare. There'll be a bar on every corner. Everyone can be liberated to be free and creative. But now the struggle, and we're stood in our little Bolshevik feet, fat caps, on pyramids of skulls, which is what they were. Lenin was an extraordinary man in some ways because in the 1921 Congress, he had a secret speech to the Congress, which didn't reveal, wasn't revealed until the Soviet Union came down. The interesting thing about communists is because they believe they are the wave of the future, they write down everything they do. And they write down all their massacres as well. The um, massacre of the Polish officer corps in the Katyn Forest, for example, which was ordered by the Politburo, and they all signed it. <coughs> Stalin signed it. Khrushchev was next. Yes, you know, I'm signing. And they all signed it. And this was revealed after the uh, breakdown. Because they believed that they were the wave of the future. And an atrocity, you see, an atrocity is important. It's not something you should be ashamed of. Because you are aiming for the betterment and progress of the whole of humanity. You have to be proud to wade in the blood of reaction in order to achieve the future which is socialism. They called it the yawning heights. The yawning heights of socialism. There's a very satirical, negative, anti-Soviet novel called The Yawning Heights, written by a working class um, university professor of philosophy called Zionoviev, who hated the system by the time of its end. Because everything creates its reverse, you see. Um, but communism has affected and mutilated the world to an extraordinary degree, which most people in the West who believe they were on the winning side in the Cold War haven't even really begun to understand. Communism has also, in a Marxist sense, affected their own societies extraordinarily, radically, whilst appearing to have completely lost in the terms of fringe leftist sects and groups. Adorno wrote in Minima Moralia that after Auschwitz there can be no poetry. He believed that after this seminal event there could be nothing but sackcloth and ashes forever. And somebody once said to him, well that's a pessimistic position, which is ultimately conservative. Conservatives don't believe life can be perfect because man isn't, and therefore utopianism is an impossibility. Um, leftists say, oh well, you, reject, you reject all forms of progress and the two sort of square up to each other in political terms. Don't forget I'm talking about the philosophies, not the sordid little compromises of parties that in the Western world are virtually indistinguishable from each other. Now, Marxism believed, almost with post-religious ardour, as it shot religious people, that everything could be changed, everything could be reworked, that man himself could be reworked. One of the most fanatical postulates is hostility to all biological notions of man and all notions of prior inequality. The idea that in the end, even human rights jargon will always disappoint. Because there are always beautiful people and ugly people. There's always unintelligent people, as many of them. And there's always very intelligent people and always arranged with it between. There's always people of great physical power and people who are weaklings. Uh, a very left-wing socialist friend of mine from years ago said, the trouble with you, he's speaking to me, is you're against <coughs> human fairness. You're against being fair. And I said, go to a maternity ward. Go to a maternity ward. And one's born without an arm or without an eye. Others are born hale and hearty. Some are intelligent or never have a moment's disease in their lives. Others are crippled from the very beginning. And he talked to me about fairness. And he said, maybe it's not like it should be, but we must strive to make it so. And I said, well, why don't you just accept the plenitude of that which is created. He said, no, that's too passive. We must work on it to change it, to make it better. Now, most people in their hearts in this society believe that making things more equal makes them better. I don't. I believe making them more unequal makes them better, which means you're monstrous in contemporary terms. But I believe, because the greater the space between people, the greater the prospect of transcendence. 
and the greater the prospect of overleaping the present means you can actually not evolve physically but mentally and spiritually into something else if there's nothing above you there's nothing to aspire to there's just endless stuff beneath you but I'm an elitist no contemporary even right wing conservative politician will admit that their party actually stands for inequality even in capitalism which has endless inequalities of outcome doesn't it that's why you have two big classes of course you believe in inequality but the majors and the Camerons and the Hades of this world the Duncan Smiths of this other world they talk about fit, um, liberty liberty <coughs> and they talk about freedom and they talk about choice 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 to schools choice of race choice of gender choice where you are you know where you go to buy stuff and so on choice but oh if you choose one option you deny another if you radically choose one thing you just privilege another variant all life, even at the moment of small decisions, teams with the bias towards inequality, discrimination. I believe in discrimination. Discrimination is a moral good and a moral law. It's an aristocratic spirituality. Of course you discriminate. You discriminate over who's your enemy and who's your friend. You don't treat people all as the same, except in some universal ninidom, which only exists in the minds of people who'd like human nature to be different from what it is. People become more right-wing as they get older, on the whole. Yeah. Even within leftist systems, people actually do get more metaphysically conservative as they get older. Why is that? Because death approaches, reality approaches. Yeah. They can't live with these deluded, nonsensical views about human life, which is based on inequality and glory and difference. History has been made by a small group, acting on behalf of and in the name of the groups from which they themselves derive their energy and purpose. Marx is almost false on almost every area of life. The men and women are interchangeable, false. That the family is an enemy construction of man when it's the basis of human dignity in all groups. That economic activity between human beings is always a form of oppression. When in actual fact, almost everybody at one level or other gets something out of it, otherwise it couldn't subsist in the first place. That man is nicer than he is when human nature is dualist human beings are kind and nasty they're avaricious but they have a capacity for self-sacrifice they're endlessly cowardly and lying but they also have a penchant for courage and glory that's what we are the great religions actually know always known what we are they shift utopianism and the desire we could be different from what we are to another world but <laughs> The leftist pseudo-religions of modernity have brought it down to this level and tried to counter-propositionally achieve it through violence and political struggle. And the reason that it's got bloodier and bloodier until the end they become second of it themselves. The emergence within the Soviet bloc of neoliberals like Gorbachev who realised the whole system was a fraud and it didn't work and they could hardly produce anything economically. And you went to the West and you went back home and people were struggling to get razor blades and bits of cheese and bits of soap and so on and he thought to himself, this is a superpower? we slaughtered tens of millions for this? and in a sense I think the, the fact that he wouldn't defend the structure as it shuddered because you can't reform a structure like that, it had to go down and he sort of managed its descent really if you look retrospectively on what he did he's hated in Russia now, hated because he took away the security of ordinary people and that generation in particularly their life expectancy went from about 76 to about 53 because they lost everything when capitalism couldn't come in they hadn't even been educated to sort of you know to write a check it was it was ter terror for them because they've never had to survive economically at an individual level and that generation just sort of died off as a gangster <coughs> capitalism came in because they had no lead up time that's the great tragedy of Russian destiny that every system has been imposed in a slap-sided and ferocious way with no softening of the edges one sort of plate has replaced another one just as Marx wanted not the idea of gradual reform the Blairs and Browns of this world but total, utter, transfiguring change which will completely revolutionise the nature of man one point which is never dwelt upon, and there's an enormous amount of work on communism now, because it's just so much in the past, people can sort of debate its details openly. The Jewish nature of communism, that is never ever discussed. 
and indeed is completely off limits in nearly all academic discourse. The truth is that nearly always half of the major core intellectuals in all communist groups are Jews or partly Jews, nearly all the half of the Central Committee or the Executive Council, the Revolutionary Vanguard or whatever it calls itself is. The rest is made up of bohemian, revolutionary Gentiles who are totally hate-filled and sparing and hostile to their own society. And it's a medley of these two groups, essentially. Outsider, insider groups to tear it down, tear it down in the name of love, of course, in the name of love, but as you tear it down, you can catapult yourself from the fringe to the centre. And it's sort of, um, it's the Jerry Healy speech. You know, in the Workers' Revolutionary Party of the, uh, the past, the most fanatical Marxist-Leninist group, probably, in British post-war history. Um, there's others, there's Tarakali's International Marxist Group, uh, the various incarnations of the Trotskyist tradition which began in the 30s with the Ballam Group in South London of the Communist Party of Great Britain and then grew up as a separate tendency. One of the things that is, of course, interesting is that when they were more powerful 30 years ago and they had known, if they had known of this meeting, there will be a riot outside, not just a bit of pushing and shoving, but an absolute riot. The pathological hatred of the radical right by the Trotskyist Marxist-Leninist left needs to be looked at, and there are several reasons for this. Partly they are the most committed to international revolution. They are the most committed to the idea that we have no groups. One race, the human race. One race, the human race, and those who doubt it go under. Reactionaries who can't be brooked, whose ideas are a menace to humanity. Because the ideas are important for these people. It's not just, oh, you've got an idea. No, two English intellectuals, you've got an idea, I have an idea. It's cricket, you know. We debate, one wins, the other loses, we draw, we embrace. No ideas are life and death. And are the basis of struggle and meaning. See, because meaning for them is in their praxis, they call it. The moment of achieved struggle and recognition of truth in ideology. A Marxist intellectual called Malcolm Evans, who's a Marxist deconstructionist, he told me, with extreme pride. I said, so you believe in the complete destruction of all Western cultural norms and the replacement of it by a foreign ideology? And he said, you're only saying that to me because you're a bourgeois reactionary of the most hateful sort. Because he once said to me, the bourgeois goes to life with common sense. The Marxist with his theory. Theory is truth. And I said, and you'll put to death those who don't agree with your theory? He said, you're putting words in my mouth. <laughs> but the irony is that these people who believed in this current of theory were near the top in nearly all of our universities between about 1930 and 1980 plus. Even in the United States. The University of Texas, can you imagine a more redneck state than Texas? The University of Texas' economic department was Marxist. This is the state of the Bushes and so on. They had achieved an ascendancy in parts of the academic world, part of the mental thinking within the Western society, which is difficult for many people to understand. And conservatism was so weak in these institutions, and when it was terrorised by Trotskyist mobs as well, it virtually disappeared. You know, I, I knew a chap who was head of sociology at the Polytechnic of North London for a period, an Irish chap. He was just a conservative, really, a right-wing conservative, O'Keefe, I think he's wearing one. Um, and every term he moved his office, because there would be a brick from the socialist workers through the window, but he knew it was coming. And I said to him, uh, why did you put up with it? You know, and he said, well, why should I give in to these people and that sort of thing? So he had a little bit of spirit, but for everyone like him, a hundred gave up. A hundred went along with it, a hundred resigned, they sort of went into internal exile within their own institutions. And don't forget, we're just talking about conservatives. We're talking about people who are well to the left of almost anyone here. So if they haven't got a chance, what do you think these, uh, the, the sort of opinions that are canvassed by this group has? Because since the Second World War, the sort of opinions that this group deals with have been outlawed in all institutions of higher education. <coughs> I went to just a BMP meeting and a bloke put up his hand and said, you've swallowed the dictionary, mate, haven't you? What's it all about then? And I said, look, I'm putting forward ideas to you which have been banned in the auditoriums where they should be heard for 60 years. They were all walked through by night, you know. Um, but there's a degree to which that's what this group really is for. Because the reason we have the society that we have 
is due to large-scale economic and cultural forces, admittedly to a degree, but it's also due to the mindset that accepts them before they physically happen. Now, Marxism, in a sense, advocates two contradictory things, but it believes in contradiction held together in struggle. It believes everything's economically determined, and yet if you theorize about the way in which it's determined enough, you can actually change the nature of the determination. There was a theorist called Gramsci at the beginning of the 20th century, who, in the Italian Communist Party ranks, who split the idea of the superstructure, culture, society, the art, the intellect, media, from the base, economics. Then Marxism can go completely cultural and just swim around, not linked to proletarian movements, <coughs> not linked to trade union politics, not linked to working class political struggle as defined by the far left. Marx was quite funny about the working class, actually, because he said, when I meet these German trade unionists, I like them less. He said, because they were sloppy individuals who'd contradict Professor Marx, as he insisted on being called. Because don't forget, he was giving the proles their theory. The structural relationship between the intellectual master and the working class followers was quite apparent. And Marx fancied himself as a politician, not just a theorist, because he founded a group called the International Working Men's Association, which is the first international. Communists talk about internationals, first, second, third, fourth. The Trotskyists won the fourth. Tiny little Trotskyists, or four men in a kiosk groups, would struggle about which one represented the fourth international, which was out in Mexico, because of course a Stalinist agent killed Trotsky by penetrating his brain with an ice pick through the skull. Louis Mercador, I think his name was, and he crept into his study and stabbed him through the skull. And the sort of anarchists to this day wear T-shirts, T-shirts saying "Ice pick a trot," because <laughs> they, you know, anarchists just love being offensive to everyone, even on their own side. And as the as the spike penetrated his brain, Trotsky's last words were a hysterical Ashkenazi shriek, in which he said. You've been sent by him! 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 Namely Stalin. And he had. And he had. That's a, you know. He went out in the light and in the dark, one could say. So, I once had a walk round um, these areas where they have these plaques, you know, these, these blue plaques. And if somebody famous lived in the house, there's a white writing. And there's, I was with... Um, a right-wing intellectual called Bill Hopkins at the time, and we looked up at this house where Engels had lived. Friedrich Engels, it said in the dates. Economic theorist. That's a bit tame, isn't it? Economic theorist. I thought, well, you have to consider. Consider in the percussion of ideology, as Nietzsche said, the idea has an effect after the stone is thrown. Consider the destructive impact these individuals and their ideas have had on our civilization. An economic theorist doesn't cut it, does it? Perhaps you could scrub that out and say the destroyer of a world. The destroyer of a world. And that's largely what Marxist-Leninism idea, ideology amounted to. The destruction of the norms of pre-existent Western civilization. Done in its name, done as the revolutionary detritus brought to power by tame theorists and political criminals who saw their way to a main chance and has dominated the thinking of our peoples in one form or another to such a degree that if you meet somebody in the arts now who's a fluffy liberal that they say, oh, all races are equal, all men are equal, anyone who says other is a reactionary beast, I'm for aid to Africa, I'm for saving the planet, they are mouthing the tenth rate approximation to this theory. The hardcore theory would appall them. Ten stages back, Fanon saying whites should be killed, because they incarnate the guilt of oppressive imperialist capitalist classes, which is based on Lenin's book, Lenin's book in 1916 called Imperialism, whereby you have to explain the fact that socialism hasn't come about, that capitalism hasn't led organically to socialism, imperialism, and the defamation of the persons of colour by, although he didn't call it this, the white economic colossus, which is still the justification for many third world radical groups, even now. This mixture of sentimentality, high theory, a Jewish desire for power, and extreme misanthropy, which we'll use because it's secularized and has no objectivist moral basis, any means to bring itself in, has almost at times brought our entire culture and civilization to the almost point of disaster. <coughs> Their armies dominated a half of Europe until relatively recently. 
tens of millions of white people grew up under their structures, lying, evading the truth, just surviving. If you did Marxist-Leninism in Warsaw when I was at school in the 70s, it wasn't a joke. You didn't write sort of ironic, quizzical and deconstructive ideas about the founding fathers. You knew that it was a secular religion and you towed a line or things would happen to you. A file would go to a secret police about you. In Romania, in Bulgaria, in Hungary, in East Germany, the dissidents would go to the shops in East Germany and there'd be eight Stasi behind them in a car. Amazing degree of surveillance. Why? Because you need to impose dialectical purity on the masses. Because if they are allowed their own way, they'll just drink, fornicate, consume, and do what they want. You have to hold them to the mark, even by terror. And you even have to build a wall around your country to keep people in. The classical thing is you build a wall to keep enemies out, don't you? You don't keep them in. Now, in closing, I'd like to say that there's been an extraordinary cowardice amongst Western intellectuals in the adoption of these sorts of views. Robert Conquest was a minor poet in Hampstead. And he used to go to all these salons in the 40s and the 50s. And it is Hampstead. Ultra-rich, creamy, bourgeois types, many of whom have never suffered anything in their lives. And many of them were Stalinists at this time. Never mind Trotsky, never mind the revolutionary alternative, but actual Stalinists people who'd read hagiographies, there are plenty of them, written to Stalin. Oh great leader, we are not worthy to kiss the feet of the son of the world proletariat. All this sort of stuff. People laugh at it now, but in those societies then it wasn't a laughing matter. And Conquest was revolted about this, and wrote two sort of revisionist books, The Great Terror and The Great Famine, about the Ukrainian famine, as a response to that. He also wrote the Lenin book in the Fontana Modern Masters. And although he got facts wrong, and although he was a pioneer, in rolling back the Mr. Doggery of that sort of thing. Don't forget, when Sartre was told there were camps in the Soviet bloc, he said, oh, but they're based upon love. <laughs> based upon love. And that makes it all right, of course. It's the idea is you torture them on their grapes, you know, that you're, we're doing it to redeem the soul of man, but they don't believe that man has a soul. <laughs> so that's a bit of a problem. <laughs> uh, but... The one thing I would think, looking back on Marxism after 150 years, in all of its bearings, is the extraordinary cowardice of some of the most privileged people in Western societies who would not stand up to this type of theory, which is how it always begins, and didn't realise that in the end it would destroy everything they loved and everything they wanted. You even see it in Oxford recently, don't you? Irving and Griffin, Griffin's not a pal of mine, you know, but Irving and Griffin are there at the Oxford Union. They're speaking for us, really, whatever we may think about them as individuals. The mob is outside, seething, you know, mad, staring eyes, all the rest, smaller than in the past, still there, though. If they could, they'd get in and tear them to pieces, and they'd burn down the library as well. They really would. And yet... The pr- uh, ninnies at their Oxford tables will say the day after, there's a terrible riot, you know. These people, Irving and Griffin, coming along and provoking these people, bringing this mayhem and this mess into our lovely little Oxford streets. These monsters. Well, in actual fact, the theory of the mob is the street version of what their ideas would be in power. And these people would have no status. And what they really believe in culturally and spiritually, sensitivity, the Western way, listening to alternative arguments, basing things on empirical knowledge, they'll be out the window. And they've gone along with this out of uh, corruption and being uh, almost too pleasant for their own good, being too comfortable, and for flirting like an adult teenager with ideas of rebellion that are half disbelieved in as they put them, and not thinking that they will be used and used again and again and again to basically destroy nearly all of us. And it's because they haven't realised this that in a slightly softer version, we're in the plight that we're in. But everything has its eras, and these ideas are bedding down. 
And I'll leave you with the fact that recently there's been an attempt in France to revive Sartre's reputation. Sartre was an existentialist and a Marxist. He wanted to bring together two enormous areas of theory. He wrote a book called The Dialectic of Critical Reason. He could only write volume one. It's 750 pages. New left books. Uh, it's a real, real ripper of a read. Uh, new, left, new left books produce it. He wrote it on amphetamine, high in jazz cafe, speeding away like this. He was going to try and find a humanist justification for Stalinism. Yes, he was. That was going to be volume two. But he could never get the theory right, and volume two never appeared. And at the end of his life, Stalin and his common law wife, de Beauvoir, joined a Maoist group. Maoist group. These are Western intellectuals, don't forget. Joined a Maoist group and sat with all these Chinese in these little garages. He edited a paper, a, a paper at the end called The People's Fist, or something like that, you know, The People's Fist. And um, he's totally persona non grata in contemporary France, intellectually. They had a big exhibition recently, Sorbonne, the big uh, Bourbourg Centre, these sorts of things. And no one went. <laughs> and no one went. And that is genuinely interesting. So people thought, because Sartre's famous existential line is that hell is other people. Maybe people thought, as they didn't attend those galleries, hell is Jean-Paul Sartre's theories. Thank you very much.